Hello everybody, now today we're going to have a look at Julia Copas's poem An Easy Passage, taken from the Poems of the Decade anthology for Edexcel English Literature A-Level. Now this is probably one of the more challenging poems within the anthology, uh, partly because it's, it's very metaphorical. Um, it's a poem that can be viewed as an allegory, a symbol uh, of the progression from childhood to adulthood. And when we think about this transition from childhood to adulthood, I also need you to consider the poem's title. Progressing from a child to an adult is a passage that we all have to take, but as we'll discover in this poem, it's not always that easy. So in this sense, the poem's title is quite ironic. Now, this is taken from the Hodder Guide. This is just a very brief summary of what happens in the poem. We'll read it through and we'll, uh, we'll pick some of the key aspects of it apart. So it says, On a sunny day, a 13-year-old girl has climbed up onto the porch roof of her house while her friend watches from the street below. It is likely that the girl on the roof has sneaked out without her mother's permission and she has not been trusted with the house key. The girl climbs through an open window and into the house. The two girls are also observed by a rather frustrated secretary over the road whose head is full of various and perhaps abortive plans for the future. Now this is quite interesting. It's, it, this, this poem really depicts quite a simple act. There isn't much of a narrative to it. But what we will discover throughout this poem is, is that it's, um, it's layered with meaning and symbolic and metaphorical meaning. All linking back again to this sort of liminal state between being a child and being an adult. And all, all again linking to this progression of childhood to adulthood. If we're unaware what an allegory is, uh, this is just a definition from, from Google. It's a, it's a story or a poem that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. So here, this simple act of, uh, in, in somewhat clandestine fashion, climbing into this girl, climbing back into her parents' home, is a wider allegory for the progression of uh, childhood to adulthood. So the poem begins. Once she is halfway up there, crouched in her bikini on the porch roof of her family's house, trembling, she knows that the one thing she must not do is to think of the narrow window sill, the sharp drop of the stairwell. She must keep her mind on the friend with whom she is half in love and who is waiting for her on the blonde gravel somewhere beneath her. Keep her mind on her and not on the fact of the open window, the flimsy hole-punched aluminium lever, towards which, in a moment, she will reach with the length of her body, leaning into the warm flank of the house. So, as I've mentioned, the girl here is quite surreptitiously and secretively uh, climbing back into her parents' house. And... The poem begins, actually, in medias res. I'm sorry if I've butchered that. It's a, it's a Latin phrase, which basically means in the middle of things. We're not given an introduction into the characters or the settings of, or, or the setting of this poem. It begins right in the middle of this journey back into her parents' home. Now, this journey, this transition from childhood to adulthood, this passage, so to speak, to use uh, the, the title of the poem is viewed as quite perilous. We are told of the narrow window sill and the sharp drop of the stairs, which implies an inherent sense of risk, a not-so-easy passage, if we're to go back to the title again. We're also told of the girl's friend, with whom she describes that she is half in love with. Now, the way I view this phrase um, is sort of like a very whimsical sort of teenage crush. If you think about the uh, the girl being 12 or 13. The idea here is that I think this, this phrase is said in a very childlike and playful way. Perhaps that age before you've really wrestled and grappled with your sexuality and um, had your kind of crushes on girls or your crushes on boys. Um, and I think that this is said as an almost in, a, in an almost whimsical way that she doesn't even know if her, her close friend is someone she's supposed to be in love with or whether they're just supposed to be friends, etc., etc. Um, but this phrase, half in love, and if we go back to uh, the opening line here, once she is halfway up there, halfway into her parents' house, this 
these two phrases show how this poem explores liminal spaces. This liminal space between being a child and being an adult. And really, this is the, the, the crux of the poem because the, the out, sorry, the outside, I glitched for a second. The outside really here is, is the domain of the adults, okay? The free, independent world. Whereas the inside is shelter, protection protection of the of, of, of youth maintaining of youth but also of, of of parental control and it is from this point that we now get a more adult and world wearied perspective um, so looking across the road from the the girl climbing into the house is a secretary uh, at an electroplating factory who looks across uh, this is just taken from the Hodder Guide, and it asks, how can the girl comprehend or foresee what the future has in store? She blissfully does not know of the difficulties of her forthcoming adulthood. And reflecting on that adult intrusion, that, that central question of the poem about the world admitting us less and less the more we grow older, it comments that the world has become less accommodating, more difficult and uncomfortable uh, physically and perhaps also psychologically the older we get. And within the poem, this more distant uh, viewpoint is continued until the description of the secretary, which we'll look at in a second. It is from her perspective that the friend is described and the secretary looks up to see the girl and perhaps her own childhood. The perspective and the structure of the poem therefore chimes and reflects with the poem's central concerns. It moves from the brightly lit girl, remember what I said about this sort of halo of innocence, this in, internal light that, that, that she, they, they seem to be kind of gifted with, and then it switches to the world-weary viewpoint of the adult, the secretary. And we'll have a look at this now. So... Again, we're back onto the, 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 the grey eye of the street, the menacing gaze of the adult world. The workers about their business in the drab electroplating factory over the road, far too, most far, from the flush-faced secretary who, with her head full of, evening, uh, of the evening class she plans to take, or the trip of a lifetime, looks up now from the stirring omens of the astrology column at a girl, 13 if she's a day, standing in next to nothing in the driveway opposite, one hand flat against her stomach. I'll pause there for a second. So we see here the language associated with the adult world of work. Grey, drab, uh, the dreary world of work that will soon await the girls in this poem. But notice how the distance is established, that they're far away from it. And she's also most far from the flushed faced secretary across the road who's looking on at this scene. Now, we hear of the, the secretary's abortive plans for the future. She wants to take an evening class. She wants to take the trip of a lifetime. But instead, she's just sat there looking at astrology columns. And this quite clearly shows that restrictive nature of adulthood. The fact that actually, well, I've got to work. I can't just take the trip of a lifetime if I want to. I can't just take evening classes when I'm tired, etc, etc. Um, and the astrology column that she's looking at, the stirring omens of the astrology column, is another reference to the future, but it's ultimately quite a passive act, isn't it? It's hoping for a better future, rather than positively enacting it. So here we see this contrast between this blissful innocence of the, of the of the childhood world and then the very world weary the very drab adult world of work and notice how the the secretary is flushed uh, flushed faced almost kind of fraught with with frustration and we also kind of get a glimpse into a somewhat of a judgmental voice um, we hear that she's that the child is thirteen if she's a day. It's quite a colloquial conversational um, language here, um, and she's wearing next to nothing. Uh, perhaps jealous a little bit of her youth and her innocence, um, and this is a, quite clearly, as it says here, a critical stance. And she looks on almost disparagingly at their freedom, and we are left to question: Is this secretary? A little bit jealous? Is she flush-faced 
with envy. But really what's important here is that we see this kind of, uh, like I said, the world-wearied view of, of the adult world of work <laughs> and um, and this sort of innocence of, of the children. So there's a clear sort of contrast here between the two. So she's standing in next to nothing in the driveway opposite, one hand flat against her stomach, one shielding her eyes to gaze up at a pale calf, a silver anklet, and the five neat shimmering oyster painted toenails of an outstretched foot, which catch the sunlight briefly, like the flash of armaments before dropping gracefully into the shade of the house. And that's it. It's a really quite simple act that happens in this poem, but as you can see, it's layered with many meanings. And one thing that this poem does is focus on um, aspects that we would probably deem as somewhat irrelevant, like the pale calf and the shimmering oyster-painted toenails. Now here, the pale calf does show that perhaps the child is more familiar with the controlled indoor world of the adults, that she doesn't get out all that much, particularly without the control of her parents. And obviously in, in common literary heritage, anything that's pale or white does have connotations of purity and innocence. We also see the silver anklet. Now, anklets very much once had connotations of slavery and restriction, but now the anklet appears quite light and harmless. Again, the painted toenails. Is this another image of the transition from childhood to adulthood? Um, you know, I'll leave that to, for, to, to you to question when the first time um, you had toenails painted, for example. Is this another symbol along with the the earrings, the tiny breasts, the, the anklet, are all of these symbols about that transition uh, to, to adulthood. Now, however, the anklet can be viewed as a, as a dual symbol here, one that is perhaps still a subtle symbol of limitation and restriction, perhaps only when the anklet is taken off that she will truly be free. Now the ending of this poem is very ambivalent and ambiguous, it's not 100% clear, um, but what we do know is that she drops back into the house. But what's really interesting is that these toenails of the outstretched foot um, almost glimmer and shimmer in the, in the sunlight and are described as being like a flash of armaments. Now this is quite interesting, this simile um, the toenails being compared to armaments. They're, now, armaments are military weapons and, and equipment. Now, when we think about this passage from childhood to adulthood, this flash of armaments, this flash of, uh, of, of steel, of resistance, so to speak, it's only a flash. A flash is here and then gone. And this perhaps suggests that more will be needed to to defend her in womanhood. Uh, the adult world is one that, as we've seen, is fraught with restriction and danger. And that although she is sort of, there is a flash of maturity there, uh, and a, a flash of, of a fire of steel, that more will be needed later in life as she transitions into the adult world. So now moving on to the structure and perspective of the poem. Um, it has a third-person narrator. It's written in the present tense, yet it also has quite frequent references to the future, which is really important when we think about the way that this poem depicts a sort of passage, a journey. Even the subtle reference to um, even the reference to the astrology column is quite a subtle uh, reference to the future. Um, the poem begins really with a focus on the girl's perspective, and before this adult intrusion this distant adult voice occurs and then we eventually shift from the viewpoint of the secretary again these shifts in perspective are all really quite important when we think about this exploration of, of liminal spaces within the poem the volta of the poem the crux the turning point undoubtedly is the rhetorical question posed in the middle of the poem it switches the focus of the poem from childhood to maturity from, in Blakeian terms, innocence to experience, the world of work, the restrictive uh, adult world in many ways. 
And these transitions from, from childhood to adulthood echo the poem's central concern. We get, we go from the brightly lit girl, this, this sort of halo of innocence, to the world-weary viewpoint of adulthood. And the poem itself consists of one single stanza in, in, in free verse. It's written in free verse, and it consists of only four sentences with frequent and John lines. And this creates quite a conversational tone throughout. And this is obviously reflected in some of the language that's used, describing her as 13 if she's a day and wearing next to nothing. Um, it's quite conversational language used throughout, which sort of adds to the, to the very much the realistic aspect of it. Now, before we uh, depart, I just wanted to bring your attention to some of these sort of contrasts and some of these oppositions that are really explored within the poem. We get, obviously, youth and adulthood at the centre of this poem, this allegory of this transition between youth and adulthood. We get freedom, liberation and work. But remember, the child's freedom isn't completely free. Um, she's not trusted with a key. And essentially, this poem depicts her re-entering the inviting warm flank and shelter of the home. We've got the indoor versus the outdoor, and the sun versus the shade. There's lots of light imagery within this poem uh, that's really um, worth exploring. Okay, we, we the, the final image, if we go back, the final image of her dropping gracefully into the shade of the house does give an ultimate impression of security, of protection, and the fact that she drops gracefully into it perhaps shows that she's not fully yet transitioned into the adult world. The very brief flash of the oyster-painted toenails perhaps shows that, again, although she's transitioning there, she's not fully yet entered into, uh, into the adult world. And really, I think what's at the heart of this poem is the fact that although the adult world is 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 one of more maturity. It's also one of quite world wearied experience, and also one as the as the central question of the poem, the central concern of the poem is the adult world is also much like the child world is also one of restriction. <laughs>